just thinking about, uh, you know, Graham's going out in the doors. <clears throat> yeah, not an easy one. But what came to mind was it, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. You know, no, no longer to be subject to the yoke of slavery. And it's, that's what people need, isn't it? To be set free. But they don't realise it, though. And, uh, yeah, go for it, matey. <laughs> yeah, they need to hear. I'm just going to go over a few script, different scriptures this morning. But the first one is from 2 Samuel uh, 6, 16 to 23. That's, that's in the NIV translation. Because um, last time I came was a couple of weeks ago. Um, we were talking about King David trying to get the ark back into Jerusalem, but he didn't consult the Lord. He just done it because it was a good idea, it seemed good for the people and it seemed good to him, but he forgot the most important person he should have consulted was the Lord. And what happened, Uzziah tried to steady the cart, he touched the ark, he was taken out, David was angry with God. But one thing he'd done, he realised he should have consulted the Lord. He consulted the Lord, he got it right with the Lord, he put everything in place as it should be, and they brought the cart into, uh, not the cart, the ark into Jerusalem, the, the second attempt, but this time it wasn't on the cart. It was the right way with the Levites. So I just wanted to um, carry on this last part of it and just look at a, a little section. And it's, um, so, 2 Samuel 6, verse 16, it says, As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And Dave, David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person, the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls or his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes but by these slave, slave girls you spoke of I will be held in honour and Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. I'm thinking, okay, wh why are you talking about that, Phil? Well, one word that came out strongly to me was despise. She despised what David was doing. And some of the reasons people despise each other is that they don't understand the heart of the person. David's heart was to please the Lord, but she couldn't see that. All she was concerned about is, this looks ridiculous. He's showing me up. I don't like the outcome of this because everybody's going to talk about us, about me. She's more concerned about me and then in praising the Lord. And it's one of those things that we can start to resent people because they're not doing the way that we want them to do it and especially as Christians we could say well I don't like the way they're doing that way I don't like the way they're doing that way but we don't know the heart but God does I looked up the word despise because we all have our thoughts and it says to look down on with contempt it's to loathe it's to scorn, it's to undervalue, it's to detest. I mean, these are strong words, aren't they? Really strong words. And, 
And she despised what David had done. This was his wife. <laughs> and it's funny, isn't it? She, first of all, she looked from the window and looked down. And it says, in her heart, she despised. But then it goes on about all the other things. He was going around. He was handing out stuff. Then he came home. She could not leave it there. She had to come down and face him head on and tell him, you're vulgar. Look at you. You're parading yourself half naked. Look at you. It's funny. When it starts on in the heart and it comes out the mouth. And sometimes we have to <clears throat> watch our tongue <laughs> and realise that as soon as you start voicing what you feel, that's when the damage is really starting now. The damage is really starting. So what we, why am I going on about this? I mean, there's different reasons why people do this kind of thing. They react in quite a bad way. It's because she probably felt humiliated by what her husband was doing. She probably felt undervalued herself. She probably think everybody's going to loathe me now because of what he's doing. She might think, well, they're going to disown me or us as a couple because of what he's doing. But she didn't understand the heart of David because it was all about her. And so often we can all say, it's all about me. What about me? Not about what pleases the Lord. Serving the Lord is not easy. It's, it's not easy serving the Lord because people want you to do it a certain way. But if the Lord has put something on your heart, you've got to go with it. And you will get opposition. Graham's going on the doors. He's going to get opposition. And he may get opposition from other people in the church down the road. They might say, why, are they, why is he on our patch? Why is, he, why is he going on there knocking on doors? It's funny, isn't it? And how you, each church can resent one another. But we're all supposed to be in this together. <laughs> Praising the Lord and, and giving him the glory. She was quite sarcastic, wasn't she? It says, oh, how the king of Israel has dis dis distinguished himself today. Real sarcasm. Look at him, parading around half naked. And he just said, look, it was before the Lord I'm doing this. When we try to serve the Lord, we can often get, um, it might look foolish. I don't know, it, it talks about being a force for Christ, isn't it? But you can do something which is maybe out of character to others. So they, they want to ridicule you. They want to despise you because it makes them feel better about their own condition. And people can't understand, why would you put yourself in these situations? There's many a time I've put myself in situations, and people say, why do you do that? Because you're doing it for the Lord. And it's hard, isn't it? To, the easiest thing for Graham is to do is stay at home. No one's affected. Nothing changes. Doesn't offend anybody. Doesn't bother anybody. But it doesn't achieve anything, does it? It really doesn't achieve anything. But don't be surprised if you're going to get opposition. But just commit your ways to the Lord and he will direct your path, like we said a few weeks ago. Keep consulting the Lord in everything that you do. Do not think, oh, well, I'll do it anyway. Always consult the Lord and he will give you the strength to stand in the difficult situations that you may face. I mean, Jesus put himself in many difficult situations. But they weren't difficult situations, but it was to the religious people. He would spend time with the lepers. He would spend time with the prostitutes. He would spend time with the tax collectors. He would spend time with the needy, the oppressed, the hurting. Everybody else in the religious circles would condemn him for it. Why on earth are you hanging around with sinners? But that's our job. <laughs> We're supposed to hang around with sinners, not be sinful, but be, come alongside them. 
Give them hope. Give them life. What happens when you despise someone? Have you ever despised someone? Has it ever come into your situation and you think, I really don't like that person. I don't like the way they are. I don't like the way they've reacted to me. What happens is, if you don't deal with it, it starts to eat you up. And when it starts to eat you up, it's affecting you more than them. You're the one who's going to suffer the consequences of that because you're the one who's focusing it on all the time. They probably, they might have said a, a, a crossword, they might have done something, but you can't let go of it. I can't let go of it. And it starts to eat you up. Jesus was despised all the time. What does it say in Isaiah 53, 2 to 3? It says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. He's nothing. That's what despise someone is. You think of them as nothing, no value, no worth. But the world will despise you if you, if you walk in the steps of Christ. It's part of the gig. And you've got to be able to deal with it. Because people will ridicule you. So another question is, can we despise God? Well, David despised God. And you think, David? Yes, David. The one who's a man after God's heart. And it's in 2 Samuel 12, 9 to 10, and 13 to 14. And it talks about when David had eyes for another woman. And it starts from verse 9. This is when Nathan, the prophet, came to talk to him after all the stuff that David had done. And it says, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret and I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. He despised the word of God. If you despise the word of God, you're despising God. Because you're not going to follow the Lord's teachings. And he went against, <laughs> he probably broke all the commandments didn't he, in one hit. The whole lot covetousness, which means wanting someone else's property, adulterous, murder, thieving, going against the word of God, you know, lying, cheating. Do you know, so you can despise the word of God as believers. 
because you're disobeying what the Lord is asking of you. You're turning your back on what he's asking for you. So despising is something that the Lord hates with passion. There's nothing wrong with despising sin, <laughs> but despising one another and despising God, he is not happy about. So why did this happen? King David was blinded by lust, by covetousness, which is, you know, wanting something that he hasn't got. He totally disregarded the word of God in pursuit of what he craved for. It was sin upon sin upon sin, wasn't it? It was just compounding, compounding. And he totally disregarded God and man. He just didn't care. It was just like, I don't care. I want what I want, and that's what I'm going to do. So he's thinking, how can, how can he turn so quickly from the man of God to Sonny to a scumbag? What, what has happened between there and there? Well, it gives you a bit of a clue in 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. And it says, In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab, which is, you know, he's commander of all the troops, out with the king's men and the whole Israel army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. He should have gone with the men. When we are not fulfilling what we should be doing, that's, that was his commission, basically, go out and fight the enemy. That was his. And God blessed him in all that he conquered. But he chose to stay at home. Because, oh, Jared can do it. He's, he's the guy. Let him get on with it. But I found with many, especially men, idle hands get them into trouble. If they're not doing what they should be doing, they're not focused, they're just sitting around doing nothing and just texting, viewing, looking, they will get themselves into trouble. I'm sure ladies do other stuff, but I'm just concentrating on new blokes, all right? And so what happens is you, you lose vision, you lose purpose, and you start getting involved in some things, some things that you shouldn't. Now, it's down to you whether you pursue it or not, or turn away and say, God, forgive me, and, and, and walk away. But it can be very consuming when people get caught in idleness. I, I, I speak to many guys, they have too much time on their hands. They, they, they've lost purpose, they've, they've become lazy, they're not, being, they're not leading their families, they're not taking responsibility. That, you know, things happen because their eye is off the ball and even when he was trying to um, get Uriah to go back to his wife and all that sort of thing even Uriah was saying it's not good for me to go back to my wife I should be at war because all everybody else is camped out in the open basically he's saying that to David well we should be there and he wasn't tempted as David was trying to tempt him because he was focused on his commission, and that was to serve in the Lord's army. When you're called as, as Christians, we need to keep focused. We need to focus on the Lord in every situation. Because as soon as we start drifting, this is when errors come in. This is where we start to realise, oh man, why am I in this situation? What's happened? And it's because our eyes drifted and we started going down the uh, wrong avenues. And we, become, and we become blinded. So don't neglect your calling. 
Sometimes, and don't despise your calling either, because sometimes you can serve the Lord, you think, it's not going to plan. Well, whose plan? Well, my plan. It's not working out the way I want it. And you start getting resentful towards the Lord. Because if you believe that was your calling, well, you do the calling then. And sometimes it's very hard because of situations that, uh, that crop up. To be a servant, you don't spell it S-I-R-V-A-N-T. There's no I in servant. It's S-E. So when we commit our ways to the Lord, it's his ways. It's not my purposes must be fulfilled. It must be his purposes fulfilled. Whether they turn out the way I want it is irrelevant. (laughs) So much things I, I do never works the way I want it but it works according to his purposes, and his purposes must be fulfilled. In 1 John 1, it says, verse 8 to 9, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us, which is despising the word of God again, you see. But one thing David always learns is to get himself right. Even though he messes up so much, he always comes back. And in Psalm 51, it says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from the presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So how do we can cope with situations that confront us? People might, might despise you or, or you're thinking, oh, I don't like this situation, I don't know how to deal with it. When I was in Norwich uh, leading this church, I had this situation that I didn't know how to deal with it. It was, it was a kind of a, um, it was a brethren church, but a sort of a, um, not, not a strict brethren or anything like that. It was trying to change the way of doing things and having a leader, which they didn't have before, because it was just a group of elders and you always had a lead elder, which is usually the, the one with the biggest mouth. <laughs> That's how it works, isn't it? You have a group of people, whoever shouts the most, oh, well, he's the leader kind of thing. But anyway, they wanted a pastor. So it was something that they struggled with because it was changed. They, uh, all the ways they used to do things, I'm coming along and and say, well, should we do this? Oh, I can't do that. We don't want to do this. Anyway, it was a bit bit of a battle. Anyway, they had a big youth club there. It was, I would say, 40 to 50, and they were, none of them were in the church. They were all outside. It's fantastic. But it was bedlam. You used to go in and say, man, I don't know how to deal with this lot. And it was, that's not my ministry. I'll get on with them, but I don't know how to deal with them. You know, there's 18-year-olds, you're right up there, you know, you're like this, what are you going to do about it, mate, you know, this kind of thing. And I thought, we've got to do something about this. So I contacted You for Christ, which was in, based in Norwich, you see. And I said to the guys, would you come and help us out? Just survey the area and see where we're lacking. Yeah, no problem, we'll come in and we'll mix, them, mix among them and, and see what... See what's about. A week later, I had a meeting with them, and they, they said, I said, where did it go then? He said, where do you want me to start? <laughs> start from the beginning. So a big list. All the do's and don'ts that the church just said, that's fine, just get on with it. There, there was no assessment risk. There's no, you know, all the list of stuff. And he said, you know, there's no control. They're out of control. You need to put order in. I said, I fully agree with you. She said, we'll send a team of people in and we'll get this sorted for I said, brilliant, let's get on with it. But the elder, the particular elder, wasn't happy with this because change. We've always done it this way. 
I said, it's ridiculous. You're trying to give them a message and they're all shouting at you and all like, they're throwing stuff. It was just ridiculous. I said, it needs to be ordered. So what happened was uh, we, we set it all up. We got Youth for Christ comes in. But the lead elder, he was the treasurer. So they got control of all the finances. And he's thinking, and he didn't like it, you see, and he started to talk to another parent who was sort of, he was in cahoots with. So he started to get the, <laughs> it's crazy when I think, he started to get the youth to turn that we're, we're, we're going to boycott it now. If you change it, we're going to boycott. I think, what's going on? And then um, they defunded it. The, the treasurer pulled, <laughs> he said, oh, you know, we're not going to fund it. I said, who's not going to fund it? That means he's not going to fund it. So he pulled the plug. So there's no money. We couldn't do it. We couldn't, we couldn't fund you for Christ to help him do this. So I went back to you for Christ. I said, I don't know what's going on. They're pulling the plug. There's, there's a revolt in the camp because we're trying to do something right. <laughs> he had all this to and fro. And I had like the other elders who were with me 100 yards away. As long as I'm at the front. We're with you, Phil. Yeah, great. So it was me and, and this guy, you see. And I said, this is, this is not right. You can't just do this. So there's, a, there's this bit of kind of... Ugh. And you're thinking, how are we going to deal with this? So I contacted you for Christ. They said, they pulled the funding. I said, you're joking. I said, I'm not. I, have, I can't do a thing about this. So they were fuming. <laughs> Everybody's fuming now. So Youth for Christ, they said, OK, we're going to send them a £5,000 bill. I said, do you expect them to pay? He said, no, but just put the wind up him. <laughs> so they sent this £5,000 bill to say, you, you know, this is how much you owe for all the time, the effort of all these, you know, these, these helpers have come in and done all that sort of thing. But it got to a point where I wouldn't stand in my ground, but I could see this guy who's been the lead elder for 30 odd years, this was his life. And you come to a point you're thinking, I don't want to destroy him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What's more important? People, isn't it? Than being right. And sometimes you have to say, I know it's right, but I'm going to pull out. Because we're not, in the, we're not in this to destroy one another. We're here to build each other up. So I, I had a word with other ministers in the area. They all knew about this because of you for Christ. They say, oh, man, get out of there, get out. I said, yeah, but I don't want to. But in the end, I had to make the decision. I said, I will pull out because I don't want to see him crushed. And so I left. I had to leave the church, which was ridiculous, really, because you're thinking good stuff was happening in the church. It was about 120, 100 odd, you know, it's not a small church, and everybody's behind you, but you had one person who was controlling the whole situation. So thank God I didn't despise him. I didn't hate him. But you could see that it could take you over and you said, well, I'm, I'm going to win this. I'm going to win this, whatever cost. And in the end, I went. And I met him in a, in a, in a church. It was a, something was going on in an evening at another church. I went there and I saw him. I went up to him and said, how are you doing? And stuff like that. And I just hugged him. And he hugged me and I said, how are you getting on? He said, oh, I left the church. I said, you're joking me. 30 years he'd been there, I'd left, so he left soon after. Did it make sense? But this is what happens, but I could see he wasn't destroyed. He was worshipping somewhere else. But I don't know what happened between me leaving, some, they might have, <laughs> I don't know what happened to him. But this is the trouble. We can get caught up with things and it can start to take over and you have to make decisions which isn't easy. 
because then you can have other people despising you because you're making a stand for what is good and sometimes you have to make sure you're standing up for the right cause. So it's one of those lessons that I've always had to learn is that when you're dealing with people, you've got to be so gentle in one way but also firm in another way and it's trying to work out how are we reacting in our faith. And that's when the, the rubber hits the road, really. So my last little section is how do we help others who could be in that situation but you're not in the situation? I just want to look at quickly at Philemon. And so um, I'm just going to read Philemon. Philemon. It's, I'll read the whole lot because it's only 20 verses, 20, yeah. And it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Anisimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he would take your place in helping me while I am away in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me you your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Now, when you read that, you just read it. But what happened? He was a very wealthy guy in charge of a church, but he had a slave. And this slave done a runner. So he, according to this, it looks like he stole something to escape. So he went from Kolos, which is in Turkey, and he went all the way to, to Rome, which is over probably 1,200 miles away. So he's travelled from Turkey all the way to Rome, and he escaped. Now, this money, or whatever items he had pinched, could have helped him fund the trip to get out of slavery and get to Rome, where there'd be crowds of people where he could hide and just be part of, of the group. However long that took, I don't know. It could have taken months. It could have taken him a year. I don't know how long. But he went on this journey. And somehow, he met Paul, who was in prison. So I don't know how that worked, but he got saved. So the question is, so Paul would have known this Anisimus guy very intimately. He probably would have asked him questions, why did you go? Where have you been? You know, what are the circumstances in it? What did you pinch? <laughs> how did you get here? What funded it? And all that kind of stuff. So he got to know him well. So when I was reading all this, I was thinking, well, what was Philemon thinking? 
he had never had any correspondence from Paul about this before. And suddenly this correspondence, this little note, basically, it's like a little note, isn't it? Just for him, he must be reading this note, and he suddenly, it's like Paul sort of beefing him up a little bit at first, isn't he? You know, you're you know, doing well, you're running the church, you're, you're encouraging, the, encouraging the troops, basically, you're doing well. But I just, you know, I could, basically, I could use my authority to tell you what to do, but in love, I'm, I'm going to... You know, I just want to mention about Onesimus. And he must have thought, I haven't seen this guy for a, a long time, because how long did it take him to get from Coloss to all the way to Rome? Then get saved, and the whole... Then the letter had to come back, so this could be a year or more. He probably thought, and now he's brought it up. What does that bring up? That little tow rag, the one who left me, the one who's robbed me, the one who's <coughs> left me in the lurch, the one I trusted, he's just gone. What would you say? Oh, hallelujah, that's brilliant news. Or would you think, he, he cost me money. He's my possession. And it, under the Roman law, they used to have um, slave catchers. They would go out and get them and, and get them back. And the owners could go and get him. That's why I think he's done such a runner. He, if he was in this vicinity, he would have been found. And they could be brutally beaten or killed. That's a, that's a punishment. So now Paul is asking him to be gracious in this situation and say, he's turned over a new leaf, mate. I want to send him back to you. Even though he was useless because it's a play of words, because it means useful. Mm. And this must means useful. So he's trying to make light heart of it in a way, Paul, wouldn't he? So, you know, you know, it's not too bad, you know. It's... But because he knew how serious it was, because if he didn't receive him well, he was in his right to beat him and to take his life. And, well, I know he's a Christian, but I don't know how people are reacting. Because you think, look at David, how he reacted. You don't know how people are going to react. So it was a real big ask of Paul. It's almost put upon him, in a way. I want you to receive Onesimus as a brother in Christ. He was a slave. Now he's free. I want you, he's on equal. But only you can make him equal. Because he's, he's your possession... You are the only one who can say he's not a slave anymore. He's a free man. What an ask. So I, I was just thinking, well, Paul says I'm an old man anyway. So he probably says, well, I don't know if his word is right. I've got to, I've got to say, or I've got to believe that Paul is right. He might have been doing a fast one on him. He might say, oh, yeah, I've become a Christian. I, I'll do exactly as you want, Paul. No change. There was a lot of questions I had in my mind. I'm thinking, that is a heck of a big ask for someone to do that. Our emotions are, why should I have to change? I'm not the one who caused the problem. I'm an innocent party in this, as far as I'm concerned. And I certainly don't want him coming back under my roof. I don't want him back here. He was a slave. Now he's got to be equal with me. Really? All these questions. And how do I know he's changed for the better? And the other thing was, I've got to tell the wife. <laughs> and the church. Because you don't know what he had said, do you? He's left me. He's, you know, and everybody goes, oh, poor you, you know, that sort of thing. Now he's got to say... I've got to accept him back as equal, as an equal. The trouble is, when you tell your thoughts to other people, they don't forget those thoughts. Well, why are you suddenly changing now? Because a year ago, you were fuming, you were having a go at this. So it was a big ask for us to change our hearts. The only way we can change our hearts is to seek the Lord, isn't it? 
It really is. Trying to do it in your own strength. You say, yeah, yeah, I forgive you, but as soon as they raise up something, you have a go at them and the old stuff comes up again. So what do I do? Because also Paul was almost saying, well, don't forget, if I can get out of here, can I stay at your place as well? So that's added pressure, isn't it? He's thinking, man, the poor bloke must be thinking... I've got the Apostle Paul, he might turn up, and if I haven't brought him into my house again and everything's hunky-dory, he's going to say, why? You call yourself a Christian? (laughs) And all this kind of stuff kicks out. So if you despise someone, nip it in the bud very quickly. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, help my heart when it gets hard. Soften my heart. You see, we're put in these situations for our faith to grow. And that's what happened to Philemon because if it hadn't have changed, we wouldn't have this letter now. He would have gone in the bin. I'm not dealing with that. But this letter was preserved. This little note, powerful, very powerful little note really, He could have disregarded it, but he realised that he had to change, not Onesimus. We can so often say, they've got to change. They're the problem. And we're thinking, perhaps it's me, I'm the problem. We have to change. So don't loathe people. Accept people, love them. Hard sometimes. Might have to bite your lip sometimes. <laughs> but do not despise God's word, his people, his church, or one another, but love. Love one another. Do not despise. It's, it's a powerful word, that. When you look at it, loathe someone, you undervalue them, you undermine them, you don't think anything of them. That's that word. But we just say thank you, Lord, that you love us, you care for us, you've forgiven us. And he's only a moment away to say, God, forgive me. And we can come before him in a moment and say, Lord, forgive me. And he will forgive. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you that you love us all so much. We thank you, Father, that you first loved us.